delighted to welcome everybody today to the uh, to our latest installment of the BCIO Toolbox Learning Series. And in this series, I've got a great industry partner, James Kernan, joining us today. James Kernan runs Kernan Consulting, and he has been a a longtime consultant to many successful MSPs in the industry. So, James, thank you very much for joining us today. You bet. Thanks, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So. With that being said, as always, guys, if you've got some questions or answers, feel free, to, our questions that come up, feel free to put them into the Q&A area. If you would like to, uh, otherwise we will be having Q&A at the end of the uh, event today. Um, this event is being recorded, so you will get a recorded link of this as well. And really what we're focusing on today is one of the big topics I hear for most of the MSPs that I'm speaking with. Everybody is obviously looking at seeing how they can increase their profitability but more importantly, build equity within their businesses. Right. And as we've talked about in you know, previous uh, uh, learning series, is one of the keys to that is not waiting until the last minute and then, uh, and then uh, looking to kind of build that equity um, at the final event. You've really got to be planning early, building up to it, and really uh, looking at this as a marathon, not a sprint. So before we get started today, and James, if you wouldn't mind clicking slide, because I think you have control right now, just want to bring you up to the date on some housekeeping as it relates to BCIO Toolbox. We've got a release coming out in the first week of June. In that release, we've got a few new features that folks have been looking for. We're going to start adding our key strategy and account management module into the system. And the first few tools that we have available to you there are a customer rating tool. So we can look at some different criteria that go beyond you know, just pure revenue and profits and really get an idea of who those key customers are in our portfolio. But more importantly, where are there some diamonds in the rough that we should be spending some more time with? We'll also be adding strategy tools like uh, the ability to do SWOT analysis or building a business canvas as you look at your relationship with your client and really trying to understand a little bit more where the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are in that relationship. But of course, also how that relationship can grow and progress. For those that are using our lifecycle policy manager, we're adding a capability for dynamic attributes. What this really means is all those great customizations that you guys like to do inside your PSA, including um, adding you know, uh, different asset types can now be managed by the lifecycle manager and you'll be able to automate the process of building that roadmap no matter how you classify your assets. We're adding a Kanban board to our recommendations module. For the, so for those of you that prefer a Kanban view versus our descending timeline, that'll be in place for you. We're going to be have, uh, have the ability to track tasks in addition to tickets and recommendations at, uh, within the system and automate those into your PSA so they can be worked on in either spot. And then the final piece will be some new templates coming in. We're adding the Office 365 CIS, the CIS now 18 as of this week, formerly 20, and the ISO assessments into the portfolio at that time. So those are just some quick updates. And as always, we'd love to have you join our customer success group where we get into conversations about how to really engage with our customers and build better relationships. And the link is down there. So uh, Rachel, as a little side note for everybody, couldn't join us today as Rachel is out doing her first love. She is filming her own movie this week. So uh, we'll, there'll be some information coming in on the group on that, but she is doing a one woman movie about some of the trials and tribulations that females face. So I'm really interested to see how that comes out and you know, encouraging her to speak more about it within the groups because, you know, it, it, it's good stuff. Yeah. So with that said, James, let's turn it to you and let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, how we can make our businesses a bit more valuable. Yeah. So great, uh, great segue, Brian. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. Like you, I frequently am asked this question all the time. People want to build value in their business, but they try to do it when it's too late. Yeah. And today, what I'd like to do is walk through what I found to be the eight secrets, things that you can do today to really build value in the business, to make it worth more. Uh, and we should be doing all these things anyway. So I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of dive in if I could. Sure, sounds good. I wanna just talk a little bit about you know who I am. Uh, I, I don't recognize many of the names out there, but I am a business coach. I've been doing this for over 15 years with Kernan Consulting, but like many of you, I used to sit on the other side of the desk and ran my own firm. And 
I started uh, way back, I think, when it was black and white TVs, it feels like, Brian. Uh, <laughs> yeah, both you and I have a little of that going on right now, James, <laughs> right? <laughs> but way back when. But uh, I first started off as a sales rep and quickly uh, became sales manager and then grew into a selling uh, VP of sales. I uh, worked for a company up in Los Angeles. We grew from about $8 million to $32 million. Uh, they start having some cash flow problems. So I left and went aboard one of our competitors out of San Diego called Technology Integration Group, or it used to be the microwave of San Diego, uh, but started with them as a director, became VP of sales and actually one of the owners. I was one of the owners of the company and we grew from 30 million to 315 million. So great track record there over that seven year time frame. I learned a ton, uh, big picture wise. And then at this stage in the 2001 timeframe, Brian was like, you know what, I'm going to go do this by myself. I'm tired of making gazillions of dollars for all the other partners because I was a minority shareholder in that other big entity. So I bought a small reseller that was struggling, ended up turning it around, grew it to 12 million and ironically sold it back to my old employer. So uh, that's kind of funny. funny how that. Work Life's out. a full circle, right? But uh, you know, I think that's a, a similar starting story to many, right? We can, we all know that we can do it better, and that's why we set out and chart our own course. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. So never burn those bridges if if you if you can. So I've been heavily involved in the channel my whole career. Served on six advisory councils uh, throughout that time frame. We won a lot of awards. Uh, was with a lot of very fast growth organizations. Kind of the biggest one was the number one fastest growing on the rising star list of CRN magazine. That was uh, quite an accomplishment. We're recognized in the business journals several years, uh, Inc. Magazine, the Inc. 500, a couple years before I sold the business in 2006. And in 2006, I actually had a long non-compete. So that's kind of what really brought me into, you know, out of running my own MSP and moving into it being uh, coaching and consulting. And I love what I do. I love giving back. I love teaching and helping um, helping you take your business up to the next level uh, in, in many cases. But during that time frame, what's interesting is I've been involved, Brian, in over two dozen mergers and acquisition transactions uh, during my time frame. That was one of the secrets at Networks Plus. You know, when I bought the company, I bought another small company, kind of blended them in. And then I sold it, you know, uh, so that uh, I had a lot of experience with that. Um, for those of you avid book readers, this is a great book to read. It, it's kind of interesting. I just wanted to share this with you, but a good chunk of my presentations really built around this book called Built to Sell. Now, I read this book a few years back and it would just kind of mesmerized me a little bit because he was really, John's point in the book is your business is worth more money with you not working so much in the business, okay? You've heard this before, you gotta work on the business, not in the business. You know, I grew up in the Midwest, I have a strong work ethic and it was like, no, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get and my business will be worth more. But his whole point is, you know, automate what you can. I'm gonna walk through some of the tips that came out of the book and some of my own tips that I found but his point really is, um, uh, you know, you need to get out of the business to make your business worth more money. And I'll, I'll talk about that. OK, so the eight tips, I'm going to start with the first one. And, um, you know, I always love that quote. You know, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And uh, early in my career, I don't know if I really agreed with that 100 percent, but I see it clear as day now. So every great business you know, really needs to have a business plan. Your business will be worth more money if you have a written business plan. And it doesn't need to be a 50 page document, but it's really um, a lot of the clients I work with, I just do a one page business plan to yeah. kind of get things jump started going, and then you can grow it from there. But really you wanna have a three year business plan that kind of paints the picture of what things are gonna look like three years from now. So I want to stop you there for a second, James. Let's talk a little bit about this. How do we get this from become, you know, moving from becoming a plan that be gets written and then gets put in a shelf and never revisited and actually put it into practice and actually follow that plan, right? Yeah. Because that, that's what I see often. You know, I'll see customers invest a lot of time into putting their plan together. And then when you ask where they are within their plan, they really can't tell you because they haven't looked at it in a while. 
Well, uh, some people spend a lot of money, time and energy, and they build out this 50 you know, page document with five year projections. And it's just an eye chart. It's expensive and it's a pain in the rear end to put together. Brian, our industry moves so fast. When, when I broke off into consulting, one of the very first things I did was like, hey, I need to have a series of exercises that I can onboard and get people going. And one of the great tools was this one page business plan. I think that's a, a secret to my success because uh, nobody wants to write a 50 page plan and it just takes too long. A one page plan, we can sit down and write that out within 30 minutes and get things going. And I've always said the one page plan is just a living, breathing document and you, you don't file it on your wall. What I have people do is we'll work on it with the leadership team or maybe one on one with the owner. And then we present what we're doing to our entire team. We do a presentation and then I ask them to pin that up on the walls because part of the plan that has your unique selling proposition, it has your mission or vision, your why, why are you doing this? Uh, your motivation, and then it has your goals and your key objectives. And uh, I always joke around, it sounds like a lot of stuff to have on one page. Uh, the trick is just make your font really small. Yeah, exactly, right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, there, I know there's a lot of folks on the call today that also subscribe to, you know, kind of that EOS principle as well. And really what you're talking about is kind of like the level 10 meeting, you know, really keeping focused on what those objectives are and moving forward. Yep. You know, I'm personally a big fan of um, the concept of the 12 week year by Brian, another book by Brian Moran. And really what that gets into is really try to build little micro plans within your plan, again, following kind of some of those EOS principles. And instead of trying to, you know, come up with this objective that seems a little daunting, how are you going to just push the needle every quarter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I love in, in that plan, you kind of break down your goals like the VTO, the Vision Traction yeah. Organizer with EOS has a 10 year plan, three year plan, one yeah. year plan, broke it down into quarters. And I even bring it down. I wanna know every day what you need to do to make money every day. And uh, <clears throat> you put together a scorecard on that and then you can kind of measure your success and, and then move. But as an exercise, I typically have uh, my customers that I work with, we update that plan every year to answer your Beautiful. question. Uh, so it's not forgotten and, and then involve, involve their team. So the, the second thing I wanted to talk about was agreements and the value of agreements. <clears throat> you know, um, in the olden days, a lot, of, a lot of organizations like, oh, we don't need an agreement. You know, we've been customers for a really long time and agreements make your business worth more money. And I think we all understand that. And uh, sometimes we let that be an obstacle uh, of, of us having agreements, but I'm not just talking about customer agreements, which are really important for all your contract any of your contractual obligations with your clients, um, you know, three-year contracts, four-year contracts, the longer, the better, okay? Uh, and I would always look at, do you have an out clause in your agreement? A lot of people have a 30-day out clause. Some people have an early termination and maybe it's an annual agreement. And you got to pay the, the remaining of the balance out. Believe it or not, those things, obviously they're hard to sell, but it makes your business worth more money. Yeah. Uh, the customer agreements are important. The vendor agreements, any strategic uh, sourcing relationship or unique um, manufacturer partnership that you have, uh, partnering agreements, marketing agreements, and then also employee agreements. And uh, I know this might be a sticking point for some people, but I've seen some really bad things happen around mergers and acquisitions with employees um, that maybe had good intentions, but then uh, they didn't at the end and, you know, leave the company, steal a bunch of accounts, and it makes your business worth less money if you don't have them. So I always liked having things in writing anyway. Um, it just spells things out for both parties and makes it clear. But the importance of agreements, I just wanted to emphasize on this. Um, James, before so, we move off agreements, I've got a question for you. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I hear a lot from my customers as I'm, you know, going through roadmap development and, and pieces like that, and we're actually adding the agreements into the roadmap, a lot of folks sign an initial contract, sign it for a period of time, and then just kind of let it run. 
So, you know, and, and I would love to get your thoughts on that because technically you've got a lot of customers that you find out are really out of contract. And the right. contracts were written in a way to say, hey, at the end of term, if there's no out clause, you know, renew for a year, renew for three years, whatever the case may be. So really, you know, I've seen in, in some of the mergers and acquisitions I've been a party to, contracts get denigrated because they technically aren't more than month to month. And there's nothing to guarantee that customer staying through that transition period. So, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, do you feel that to be something that can drive down valuation? And more importantly, you know, what are steps that an MSP can take to not fall into that trap? Yeah, that's a great point. So absolutely, a lot of us are guilty of having, you know, long-term agreements, and then all of a sudden they renew automatically month to month. Right, the old, they're not going anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> that, that doesn't really help you out overall. Um, number one, make the investment and get your contracts done right. So have an attorney who theoretically would ever be representing you in court, be the one who either does your contracts or rubber stamps them. There's a lot of good templates. You know, I've got a big business library. I share multiple uh, long-term, you know, cloud and MSP agreements with our community. Do that all the time. And I'm happy to send some over to Brian to share with, with the team here. Uh, you need to have a good agreement, okay? Uh, have your attorney rubber stamp it, but also the importance of don't have them sign it and then move on. You want to be meeting with that customer on a regular basis anyway for your QBRs, and you should always be tuned into what the term is on the contract. Um, if you are so busy where you can't make the time to go do your QBRs, at a bare minimum, make sure that the agreements renew for the original term. You know, I don't like the month-to-month -month, uh, agreements when they renew because uh, it makes it really easy for clients to leave. So yeah, those are a couple ideas. Perfect. Well, thank you. You know, I agree with uh, with that. You really got to keep that engagement approach. And even if you've got a good relationship, you've got to look at it from the standpoint of relationships end, things change, dynamics change. So you want to make sure your interests are covered, especially if you're getting within the, you know, the three-year period before an acquisition, especially. Yeah. And one other point to that, most sales professionals or business owners, when they're trying to sell a long-term agreement, they're like, oh, they're, you know, it, it's not a negative, it's a positive. And you got to present the benefits of long-term agreements. Like, hey, we're going to lock in your pricing for the next 36 months. That's good news. I can't raise our prices regardless of what happens. So, um, you know, that- yeah, yeah, or tie it to the story we tell for those that are BCIO Toolbox subscribers, hey, we, we have to execute this plan together. You know, we, we, you know, we put this roadmap together with a forward-looking plan to make sure we get from point A to point B. Just like that roadmap, we need a contract that supports that capability as well. Right. Yep. So the, the third point I wanted to bring up, Brian, is, is the, uh, the one core service. All right. So many MSPs have got a dozen, you know, half a dozen core services that they offer. You know, we do voice, we do cabling, we do AV systems, we do managed services, we do security, we do the, and the list goes on and on and on. And next thing you know, um, you know, they do everything, but they're not the master of one core competency. A, a key point in the book, and I agree with this to a certain extent, you want to have one service. I always call it, you know, what's the one core service that you're going to be the best of the best in your local geography? And maybe today that's cybersecurity. You know, maybe it's true managed services. Maybe it's disaster recovery and, and backup solutions. So you pick what that core competency is and you focus on that, but you also can have complementary services. So I'm not saying just have one core service. I'm saying have one core service that you're a rock star in and then have complementary services that will help bring leads in uh, around that core service. But if you've got a core service and a good reputation and you're known to be one of the experts, you can always charge more. Uh, you can always hire the best talent. Uh, you'll make more money by having a, a, a core service that you're really, really strong with. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah you know, it does for my seat because some of, one of uh, my competitors here, I'm based in Connecticut for those that don't know, and, and one of my competitors when I was an MSB here that really had one of the biggest growth trajectories, they didn't take the approach of verticalization or anything like that. They really focused, and at the time, this was a core need networking, right? They, yeah. get way, they went deep 
and narrow on networking. And their thought process was, look, at the end of the day, servers are servers, these things need to be done. But if I try to be everything, it won't be there. But good networking competency seems to be difficult. And who needs good networking competency? Larger scale businesses, single site owners don't require as much as those larger scale businesses that have multi sites, have multi departments and need that networking. So it also drove up with their bill rates and what they were managing. So, you know, when I, when I listen to that, it really kind of got me into that core thought of just like you said, you got to be a rock star in something specific, but we're all going to have to have wraparounds, you know, in our business to make sure that we can serve our clients. And exactly. And if we, uh, and it, and sorry guys, I'm, I'm having a proud papa moment. Don't mean to introduce, but my daughter just to put a thumbs up in me. She is the president of our uh, junior year class now. So anyway, sorry, right. that's a proud papa moment. I got the thumbs up. Thank Congrats you for you. indulging me. <laughs> yes, the, uh, Jay, the session will be available for on-demand viewing, you know, since I interrupted as well, I'll share that out loud. But yeah, to your, to your point, you know, I, I think that's, you know, those core services and being, you know, the, and having those wraparounds and really making sure you're an expert at something really can be a differentiator. So good stuff. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge differentiator. And one last point on this slide I wanted to make is regardless of whatever services you have, you really need to make them, uh, the packaging and the pricing should be all subscription. All the services you have, try to avoid the one-off, the break fix. You know, your business is worth more money with the more monthly contractual monthly recurring revenue that you have so package or even staffing you could do managed staffing if you put an engineer on site and you're just billing by the hour do a flat fee per month of x amount of hours and then maybe have a, in the contract where you can bill for an overage uh, but try to make everything all your services subscription based so you can do uh, you know proactive billing Beautiful. so the fourth part really is, uh, is what assets do they have? So this is a little bit more confusing. And the, the key point on this, most of the asset, you know, I kind of break it down into people, process and technology. The, the people in many cases, the smaller acquisitions, you're, you're really gonna be hiring some key talent. So you need to make sure that that's, those are good people that mimic your core values. They've got the skills that that you want to hire anyway, and that you want, uh, the people are really important. Uh, you also look on the balance sheet of what capital assets do they have. You gotta look quickly at that. They might have a, a valuation that's way too high on the assets yep. or maybe way too low because they've depreciated everything out uh, for tax benefits. But you know, just match up those hard assets. Is that something that would be valuable to me in my business? The client list, you know, is what's their book of business look like? Do they have contracts on everything? Is it all residential clients for managed services or is it all commercial accounts? Is um, the, the marketing database is another thing, you know, show me your marketing database. If it's 16 people, you know, that's a big red flag for me. Yep. If it's 16,000, it's like, oh, that's valuable. You know, that's important. Uh, what certifications or maybe intellectual property do they have? So the reality is just analyze all the assets and is this something that is of value to me? Does this make sense to add this into my business? It's gonna help, is it gonna complement? So look at it from that perspective. You know, a funny part here is when you talked a little bit about the Avril, uh, overvaluation of equipment and tools, we were, years ago, we were looking at making an acquisition of a voice over IP vendor to really just kind of help accelerate us into that market space. And they just could not come off of what they interpreted the value of the equipment sitting in their garage aging out really was. And, and it blew the deal quite candidly because it just, we, we couldn't get them past that point of some of it's really useless. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is. And, and assets depreciate really fast. Uh, Especially in technology, technology, right? Right, yeah. So, I mean, it, that's an easy thing. Just take a look at the list. You can Google or shop eBay just to get some ideas of what that equipment would be worth. Uh, but that's a, a quick way of kind of figuring things out. So the, the fifth part is uh, clean and accurate books and accounting. All right, I, I can't tell you how many times I've come in and start working with the client and their books are way outdated or miscategorized or they're just wrong. And uh, nothing turns off a buyer faster than when you demonstrate you know, incorrect books 
or outdated books and that you're way behind. You know, I, I don't know how anyone today could be running their own business without real-time dashboards and what I call real-time accounting. You want the data in the system as fast as you can. This is another area that I've seen a lot of people kind of skimp on and uh, maybe they'll keep doing the books themselves or their spouse will do the books or one of their children uh, and they're trying to minimize the expense. Get someone who really knows what's, uh, what's what, you know, set up your chart of accounts properly and get real financial reporting because it's going to help you grow your business and it's also going to make your business uh, worth more money. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes total sense. And, and you're spot on here, right? Because it really beckons two questions. If you can't get your books in line and have your money in line, what does that say to your other processes within your business? Because there really shouldn't be anything more important to a business than financial survival, right? Part one. Part two, your point about hanging on to it too long. You know, we look at all kinds of tools as a technology group, you know, industry, we're always looking to automate. We want AI. We want all these great things that we talk to our customers about. And then we sit there, you know, the old joke about the shoemaker making their own shoes, right? We'll sit there with some of the oldest technology to do this, but we're not doing ourselves a service. And just like anything else, the more we find that we let go, because this is one of those pieces when you talk about work on your business, not in your business, yep. that they don't let go of early enough because they're, you know, I think we all tend, especially first-time business owners, to be a little protective of that data, a little sensitive to that data in general, especially if our numbers aren't quite where we want them to be and we don't want to bring in that help. And I'll tell you, when you have a proper CFO resource, whether it's fractional or real time, the things you can do in your business with the same amount of money become amazing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Important books and, and uh, the reporting, I think, is is really critical. And we do a lot of valuations in, in our company when we're helping, you know, consult with people around mergers and acquisitions. And, you know, we just need three years of accurate financials. And uh, there's other questions and criteria that go into it, but just I would need three, year, uh, three years in a financial package. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, the next one, number six, I call what is the business Bible. OK, one of the big values uh, business business owners have is all the documentation. And there's a lot of great organizations in technology. IT Glue did a great job in kind of stepping in at the right time and helping organize client and in internal documentation. But it goes a little step further than this because there's two parts. Number one, your business is worth more if you've got all of your documentation put together for your departments, your processes, um, That that's critical. And then secondly, automate what you can, okay? Leverage technology with these tools. They're so much more sophisticated today than what they used to be, but you wanna automate as many of the processes as you can. Uh, the very, one of the very first transactions I was involved with, they actually wrote some middleware to kind of pull these programs all together and the data just fed with off the shelf uh, packages, a CRM, a quoting package like QuoteWorks and then QuickBooks. What was really cool is you type in the information once and then you send out uh, marketing campaigns and then an inquiry would come back. You don't have to do redundant keystrokes. It was their system was really cool how they how they wrote and kind of pulled all this together and um, it eliminates mistakes. It's just so much more efficient. So automate as much as you possibly can. The tools allow us to do that and then document everything. And uh, this is a tough thing to see, and it's very frequent. Most people do a miserable job of, of documenting their processes, but if you're big enough to be able to do this so it all doesn't fall on your lap, delegate it to your department heads, and then it's a moving forward strategy. Just start documenting one process at a time. Just do one a week uh, or a couple a month. Just start with that, and before you know it, you'll have your Bible, your operations Bible all put together. So it's one of the key things when why people buy into a franchise is because the recipe book's already done. They've got the whole operating manual. They know what's what's what. When businesses want to buy somebody else, they're looking for the documentation. So, um, you know, make sure that you do a good job with that. 
Yeah, and I'd add to that, this relieves some other stressors that you run into as you're building your business. You know, a lot of times I've seen MSP owners push off hiring because they have to build that standard operating procedure before they can bring that person on. So now when they're at that critical time in need, they're pushing out that relief even further in the process, which again, what do you lose in terms of value to your business in that time frame? Are you missing sales? Are you missing other opportunities you can be taken care of? So the earlier you do this and doing it during, we saw that during the, when we were thinking about our acquisition years ago and, and our exit strategy, we really sat down and, and committed a year to really getting our processes documented, knowing that we weren't going to sell for at least two more to really make sure that we can get them and then also have time to re-engineer them during that process and really make the Bible, you know, a hardened cookbook, if you will, at that stage. Yeah, yeah it, the documentation is so critical and, and it's not just to make your business uh, more valuable. It, it will make things so much more efficient and your productivity will go up. It's a great, you know, you need it anyway. Uh, people underestimate the importance of training your employees, whether it's a new employee or an existing employee use this documentation for training purposes. Uh, I've always said, how can you hold people accountable if you don't uh, offer them the training and have things in writing? Yeah. You know, then they're, everybody's kind of guessing. So this is a really important one as well. The, the next one I'll say is uh, something else. You want a diverse customer base. Uh, when buyers kind of step in or whenever I'm involved analyzing a business, the rule of thumb is you want you want no one client to represent more than 15% of your business. Now, when that golden goose comes along and it's happened to me and I'm guilty of it, when I was growing my last organization, I had a, a customer that came in, we said, yes, we won the contract and immediately it represented 50% of my revenue and about 60% of my profit. So I kept that confidential, I didn't tell them and it really cheerlead that in the office, but I use those profits to help market into new verticals to diversify my portfolio uh, because you don't, um, when customers know that they have that leverage over you, they'll use it to their advantage and it will hurt you, but also it makes you more vulnerable and your business is worth less money because if you lose one client that represents 50% of your business, your business value goes way, way down. So. And I'm glad you said that part about using the profits to diversify a bit because, you know, really there's always that that part where, hey, now I can pay back some of what might be owed to me as the business owner, right, when, when this golden goose comes in. But the reality is you do need to use that to try to expand out because it is a risky place to be, not only just because of the profit and revenue potential, but those types of companies have even less control on their destinies than the small to mid-sized companies. You know, um, we when I was a hired gun after um, after my acquisition, I uh, I was working with a firm that had, you know catered to the enterprise space, and a merger happened to two large Fortune 1000 companies, and we saw seven million dollars worth of revenue go away in less than 30 days. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's sad. That's sad. You don't want that yeah. to happen. You know, fortunately, we were diversified enough. It didn't kill us. There were some layoffs along the way that were direct result of it. But the, the point was, it really can be a challenge. So you do have to have that, that mix here. And, um, you know, for those that are verticalized, too, you want to probably keep a little bit of an eye on what the, the vertical trends, too. Because right. if that vertical is a shrinking vertical for some reason, or just like we experienced with COVID over the last, you know, 12 to 15 months, if it's a vertical that could be exposed to a pandemic or some other regionally based kind of calamity, that's that's a concern too, right? You know, I've, I've got a couple of clients that were very hospitality and entertainment focused. And while many MSPs were growing in 2020, um, it was a lean year for some. Yeah, yep, exactly. That's a great point on the vertical side. I'm Deliberately, when that last company that I ran, we diversified our portfolio, not just with the accounts, but in the verticals that Brian was hinting at. And normally there are cyclical buying patterns. You know, a lot of commercial accounts do a lot of buying, you know, Q3, Q4. Education is a heavy Q2. Their fiscal year ends the end of June. Government, their fiscal year end the end of September. So that's big. A lot of spending in Q3. Uh, we started off doing a lot of business with education and government, and I wanted to kind of keep in level playing field. I wanted, you know, growth like this, not like this. And when you're 
financing your own business, cash flow is king. Uh, so you, you need that, um, that cycle, you know, not to be annually uh, hurting you, but month over month, you want to be able to grow. So now, diverse- maybe, maybe shift around there for one second on that, James, before we leave that topic. If you were in the buyer's seat, <clears throat> there's probably, you know, you're looking at how to hedge your risk in this acquisition as well. And you've probably already got a number in your head that says, hey, there's a certain amount of customers that we're either not going to choose not to retain from this purchase once we do in there, or we know we're going to walk away. And if you can really make that a much more linear equation, that, that provides a little bit less in the buyer side of it and could earn you a few more goodwill dollars if that's where you're trying to get towards the end of that sale. Would you agree with that statement? Or do you feel I'm off base on that look? Oh, I completely agree. Uh, really, the only example I think is just a, a real blunt one that would fit would be if, if all of your managed clients are all commercial accounts, but you're looking at buying someone and all their managed clients are residential and they, they charge $75, you know, or an hour yeah. and you charge $150 an hour. You know, that, that's not a fit. You, that, those two customer uh, bases are not going to blend well together. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably a whole topic we could talk about for a while, too, because when you look at acquisitions, if billing rates don't line up, if skill sets don't line up, there's other risk that goes beyond the pure, how do we meld these companies together and cut some costs, right? Exactly, exactly. So, and, and I, we're in the people business. This is a great quote from Jim Collins. Um, people are not your most valuable asset. The right people are. Right. And, and Brian, I know you're a big traction fan and it's all about having the right people in the right seats. Yeah. Uh, but you want to make sure I used acquisition for our benefit and help line of clients. One of the biggest assets are the people. And uh, that's really one of the key things I was always looking at, uh, especially the smaller ones. You know, we've done a lot of distress scenario uh, acquisitions um, as well. And so that's really the next one, the right people in the right positions. Uh, people do business with people and you know you want to have the right people in your business. Um, Brian, I don't know if inside the community, if you've done any kind of vision planning or core values planning, uh, if you've had any of, of your customers do, uh, you know, educate them on, on that of the importance, but it's, it's all really important of the culture. And normally the culture of the business starts with the owner, the leadership team, and it's a, a mere reflection of the core values of me personally will be what my business will look like. That's normally what happens. And you need to protect that culture. You know, one bad apple can ruin the bushel, so to speak. And you wanna make sure you're using your core values as guiding principles to make decisions on who you're bringing into the organization. And you can, I've seen a lot of bad acquisitions happen because they bought a company they thought was fantastic. It looked great on the surface, but it had a lot of bad people and it crushed their culture and hurt their culture. So uh, you want to make sure that uh, there's the right people, the right skills, and you can always develop people with training. We do a lot of training at Kern Consulting. I have a sales certification program, a leadership training program. Um, And you need to invest in the people uh, after you kind of assess where they're at. I think we all need to be lifelong learners and continually grow ourselves. And one last thing I'll say on this, and this is the real small MSPs, and it's a hard jump to make, but if if you're a selling owner, okay, you're the only salesperson in the company, that's a perfect example of if 100% of the revenue is on your shoulders, that's not good. You normally want to have sales reps in the organization. And I've built out sales departments for a lot of growing companies. And I like starting with two. And let me just tell you why. Um, I'd rather you have two part-time sales people that are competing against each other instead of one full-time person. And, you know, sales people require a lot of energy. You know, engineers and most MSP business owners are technically minded. And there, many are introverts. They like the lights down. It's quiet in the office, you know, and I'm a natural salesperson, Brian, and it drives me crazy when I walk into an office to do an assessment and it's all, all the lights are off. The the shades are drawn. It's super quiet and you can hear a pin drop, you know, six doors down. Um, You know, salespeople are the opposite. They like lights on, they like noise. It's energy 
that keeps them motivated yeah. to pick up the phone, make calls. It's all about activity and meetings. Uh, but you want those salespeople competing against each other. So comparing the number of calls, number of meetings and quotas, right? I've been a big believer in the hire two too, because they also have to have people to commiserate with. It's difficult to be the only salesperson in that fishbowl, right? Because when you really think about our, our role in that, it's based on rejection, right? So here you're in a sea of people that are really appreciated for what the skill sets are that they bring in, in you know, moving things. And sometimes they can't connect the dots between the salesperson's role in the business. You know, they'll be like, hey, you know, I don't know if James is a really good sales guy because all I ever hear is no over there, not knowing you, you got to have 10 no's to get to the 11th. But yes, that that is the one that drives the bus and, and you know, brings in the revenue. So really, I love the comp competitive aspect of this because truly, you know, nobody wants to be the worst salesperson on the sales team, especially if it's only two. <laughs> and, then the, uh, and then the other part of it being, you know, they, they need that support system, because as you and I have discussed offline many times, you know, technical ownership, they're learning the sales management process and what that's all about as well. So it's tough for them to understand, is this working? Is this not? If there's not other people kind of that you can benchmark against, and even if it's just the other rep you got, it gives you a little sense of, okay, well, they're both having the same struggles. So that must be sales as opposed to that's just Jim. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. No, that's well, well said. So, and then just kind of to round things out, those were the, the eight core things I wanted to talk about, you know, the five other big ideas I just wanted to share and we'll wrap up, you know, one, you all should always uh, run a company as if it will last forever. So the decisions that you make uh, need to be long-term ones. And Again, you try to pull yourself out of every single process. You don't want to be the bottleneck in your organization. Again, your business is worth more money with you working less in it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Try to package all your services as, um, as subscriptions that you bill automatically. Uh, you know, that's one of the first goals I always set with people that I work with of, you know, what's your monthly break even of all your expenses? Okay, it's $40,000. Well, that's our MRR goal. Now, would it be great on the first of every month to have $40,000 just drop into your bank account, pays all your fixed expenses and everything else is just gravy of new accounts and projects and things like that. So that monthly recurring revenue is critical. Um, I've talked about, you know, your business running without you, I think working on the business, not in the business. Focus on one thing, one core service that you want to be famous for and really put a lot of time and energy into that. Um, we talked about that and how important that will be, and that will make you unique and stand out and justify of, of being able to uh, charge higher rates. And then uh, lastly, make, make sure no one client makes up over 15% of the business. So we, we talked about that. So that's kind of the recap, Brian. We kind of went through the business plan, written agreements, the core services, the unique assets, keep clean books, the business Bible, the power of documentation, the seventh is a diverse customer base, and the people, you know, the right people in the right seats was, was number eight. So that's it. Um, I'll hand the floor back off to you, Brian, and maybe we can do some Q&A. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, as we're heading into Q&A, first, guys, uh, two ways we can do Q&A today. You know, feel free to raise your hand. If you want to come on live, we'd love to have you join us here within the uh, within the meeting event as well. Um, otherwise, you can certainly put your Q&A into, um, into the chat. As people are kind of in, uh, James, maybe if you could make me the host again, I can manage some of that for you. So you can just focus on answering the questions. You should be able to do that from the panelist area. But um, with that being said, guys, as we're heading into the Q&A and, and some questions coming up, I think, James, you have an event coming up in the next month or so. And it's an event that you hold a few different times a year. So maybe you'd like to share with people what, um, what that's all about and um, you know, and how, how they can get involved if they want. <laughs> Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Brian, for teeing that up. I'm uh, really excited because this is our first face-to-face -face meeting that we've had since COVID hit. Uh, but we have uh, every quarter, we run a two-day event. Uh, it's typically the last Thursday and Friday each quarter. And what I do is I'll, I'll do the event for both guests and for uh, member companies that work inside of our community. And the member community 
all gets up and does 10, 15 minute presentations on what their business, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, and what their goals were and how they delivered. So uh, that's great because you learn a lot of really cool things about what other people are doing all around the country and what's working and what doesn't. I've got tons of out, over a dozen outside speakers uh, that, that present great business content. And the whole two-day format is really all about growing your business. How do we grow our business more effectively, make more money and save more money? So that's in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, if you want any information on that, I'm dropping links all over the place out in uh, social media and up on the website. But you can just call my office or uh, the information's up on the website as well. But uh, for the community here, I normally charge $150 for the tickets for that. Uh, we're wrapped around right around the College World Series. So if you're a baseball fan, you certainly want to be there as well. Uh, but basically, I'll do free VIP passes for any of the guests today, Brian, in your community that are interested awesome. in coming. Thank you for that. And it's a hybrid event. So you can log in remotely through Zoom. We'll be running Zoom live the entire time or you could be there in person. And um, if, if, you're, if you are remote, you're gonna miss out on a lot of the networking that we do. And it's uh, two days of a lot of fun. So hope uh, to see you guys there. Yeah, James, uh, unfortunately scheduled this one where I've got a wedding that I have to attend that weekend. So I don't get to be a part of this one, but I can't wait for the Q3 and heading out to San Diego. Just, you know, if nothing else, that we actually get to travel again, right? You know, this yeah. is uh, becoming a nice part of it. Well, with that being said, I haven't seen any Q and questions coming in. It seems like the group has gotten a good understanding of what they want to learn for today. You know, I'll ask again uh, before we close out for today, anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask of James? Otherwise, what I will tell you is this will get posted up on the website, so you'll have the ability for on demand. As always, uh, those of you that registered and weren't able to attend, not that you would hear this, uh, we'll be sending that link out to you as well. And we'll be making this video available within our Facebook group as well. So uh, folks that maybe didn't hear about the event today can also learn a little bit about uh, how they can make their businesses a little bit stronger financially. And James, as always, man, I enjoy having you on and, and uh, having a chat with you. Thank you so much for the knowledge you share. Yeah, you bet, Brian. Thanks. Uh, this was fun. Appreciate it. We'll uh, we'll see you soon. All right. To anybody else, uh, if you want to reach out to James, along with those videos being uh, left there, we will post up his LinkedIn profile as well. So click connect with him on LinkedIn. If you can't find your way to his website, that URL will be there as well. But I really encourage you to take some time and learn from James. You know, he's a, he's a gentleman that no matter how things end up, he shares a wealth of knowledge with the folks that I've put in contact with him. So with that, we will see you next month here in the BCIO Toolbox Learning Series. Next month, we've got Ross Browse joining us. And Ross is a, a BCIO Toolbox customer that has also been really crushing it with video of late. He was actually one of the five participants for the Aston Martin last week in Robin Robin's technology toolkit uh, group. So he's gonna help us get over our stage fright and become better video people. So we look forward to seeing you next week. And James, thanks again for joining us today. You bet. Thanks, Brian. Right. Take, Take care, care, everybody. Bye now.